prayer. This morning, we are going to uh, look uh, again at Ephesians. We are going to look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. And, and one of the things that I love about Ephesians is that there is a lot, well, I mean, Paul does this, there is a lot of content in uh, the book of Ephesians, a lot of stuff for us to mull over and meditate upon. And, and even with a passage as small as these, uh, you know, six verses, 14 to 21, is that six verses? I don't know, whatever number of verses that is. Uh, that, there's so much content in there, and we could spend probably weeks pulling out all the meaning of it. But one of the things that I like, in addition to all the rich content in there, is the reality that especially in these first three and a half chapters of Ephesians, Paul drops so many jewels of information about who we are because of Jesus. Who we are because of Jesus. And, and this little section is full of it, and we'll refer to some of the other parts in the first three and a half chapters of Ephesians that will tie in more. But time and time again, Paul tells us more about who we really are. And that's really important because there's a radical change throughout the story of scriptures in the definition of who we are as people. But before we get to that, we're going uh, to read this particular section, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. If you're at home, I would invite you to pull out your Bibles and follow along. If you're here, you can read on the screen or pull out your Bible as well. Uh, but this is what Paul says to the people of Ephesus. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled in the measure of filled to the measure of all the fullness of God now to him who is able to to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord. Amen. Well, remember how I mentioned that uh, my English teacher in high school struggled with Paul because of his run-on sentences? Well, there are other reasons my English teacher in high school struggled with uh, Paul as well. One of them is that uh, he also used a lot of mixed metaphors. And uh, in good, proper English, you don't use mixed metaphors. That is, if you are going to pick a metaphor for describing how something is or what something is like, you should stick with that one metaphor instead of throwing in a bunch of different ones, right? So, uh, you know, when you hear the song, when the moon's in your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore, right? Anybody familiar with that one, right? <clears throat> right? Okay, so that's a, a metaphor for the moon, the pizza pie. Right? But if you started to throw in other metaphors, like when the moon's in your eye, uh, like a big pizza pie, and a pearl in the sky, ooh, that even rhymes. <laughs> that, that's a more. Then you're starting to mix 
uh, similes in that case, but you're starting to mix metaphors, and that's really kind of a no-no. It's either got to be a, a, a pizza pie or a, a pearl, right? Um, personally, I think probably a pearl would be more romantic, but whatever. <laughs> Uh, slightly more accurate, too, because of color reasons. Anyways, um, but Paul throws in all kinds of metaphors in the same thing. And, and, and that's because there, is, there, is, there, there are ideas that he's trying to get at that, that it is insufficient to use one metaphor for these ideas. One metaphor doesn't cover it. There are ideas in here that are beyond human comprehension. And the only way to try and grasp some portion of what Paul is trying to convey is to mix up the metaphors. But... One of the other reasons that my English teacher struggled with Paul was that Paul does this thing where he says, for this reason, right, or therefore, or because of this, or whatever, and it's unclear, looking at the immediate sentence previous to this, what's the for this reason, or the because, or what's the connection to what Paul said before? Because Paul will go for paragraphs and paragraphs with, like, basically a parenthetical phrase, right? He'll start talking about this topic. He'll say, you know, uh, in the very beginning of, uh, of chapter 1 of Ephesians, right? He says, ever since I heard of you and your faithfulness and blah, 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 I pray for you, right? And then he goes and he starts talking about all kinds of other stuff. And then he comes back in chapter 3 here to say, for this reason, I pray for you. And really what he's talking about is because I heard of you and your faithfulness and how wonderful things were and so on and so forth, way back in chapter 1. So Paul has illuminated all kinds of reasons and then... He doesn't clearly say that, oh, by the way, I'm going back to the very beginning of my letter and saying, and continuing on from there. And all the stuff in between was explaining these reasons. Nonetheless, that is true. We can see some of these reasons if we look back a little bit to chapter 2, verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 19, we can see... Paul saying, <clears throat> consequently, again, one of those words that needs to have something previous to it. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. See, now we're already getting mixed metaphors, right? We're talking about citizens of heaven and members of God's household which are two different things. One can be part of the other, but they're not necessarily the same thing. But then he moves on, verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And now we're making a transition to another metaphor. We're citizens and we're members of the household and now we're a building, right? Uh, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Oh yes, I guess we are a building now, Paul. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You see, Paul is mixing all these metaphors because all of these things are true. There is a way in which we are part of the household of God, very real way in which we are part of the household of God. Paul says that we are adopted as God's children. And, and further, that we are co-heirs with Christ. Now, that is mind-blowing, right? It, 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 to get a tiny taste of that, Who's, who's the richest person in the world right now? What is it, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk? Okay, so let's say my son, who's really smart, so smart, and he answered my question. Let's say my son, Aaron, who answered that question, right, is uh, adopted by Elon Musk. And he is going to be heir for Elon Musk's 
whole entire fortune, including, you know, the whole Tesla thing and the whole SpaceX thing and the whole, like, satellite internet thing and whatever else he's going on, right? All of a sudden, Aaron has gone from being the humble son of a minister to the heir of the richest person on earth, right? And yet, that comparison is so infinitely inadequate for the real deal. See, because it would be more like Aaron was an enemy of Elon Musk and tried to kill Elon Musk, and Elon Musk turns around and forgives him and adopts him as a child. Except it would be more like Aaron was an ant, and Elon Musk was, you know, a human, and Aaron the ant was trying to kill Elon Musk. Except it would be more like Aaron is like a bacteria, <laughs> which, you know, sometimes he's like a big walking bacteria. He's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a teenage boy. But <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I re you really, you really should have to sign a waiver if you're a pastor's kid because <laughs> it's really not fair. Anyways, right? And, and the comparisons go on, right? A God who has created everything that is and was and will be, who is Lord above time and beyond, who created the heavens and the earth, who created everything there is, has taken people who rebelled against them in their own pathetically minuscule way and has said to them, you know, in spite of the fact that you deserve death and annihilation, I am going to send my only son to make things right between you and I, and that will not only mean that you are no longer my enemies, but now you are my sons and daughters, and I will give you everything. And what that means exactly is beyond our comprehension. I mean, God will never die, and so there's a sense in which, you know, being an heir of God does not mean that we will inherit everything when he dies, because he's not going to do that. But at the same time, God clearly passes the baton on to his son Jesus, who is also God, and, and hence we get complications, but passes the baton so that in the book of Revelation, you know, we hear loudly and clearly that the Lamb is worthy of all honor and glory and power and praise forever and ever. Hallelujah. So not only are we no longer strangers and foreigners, as it says in verse 19 of chapter 2, but we are now fellow citizens. And not only are we not just fellow citizens, but we are members of his household. And not only are we members of his household, but God himself will dwell within us because we are being built together to become a dwelling place for God. And this is where it gets complicated again because we are told that the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us, makes his home within us. And every believer has been given this, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we ourselves as individuals are temples of the Lord. But also, in a way, we are being built together as a temple of the Lord. We're not just individuals who are the body of Christ. We're also together the body of Christ. And both of those bodies are somehow singular, right? So that we are becoming one in Christ. And so the gift goes on. We are brought in out of the darkness, out of the gnashing of teeth, out of the, the rebellion and the sin and the hate, we are brought in to be citizens. We are brought in to be part of the household of God. We are being built, not just you and I as individuals, but you and I together are becoming one. 
Now, that can be an uncomfortable thing. And in this world, it is an impossible thing fully and completely. But this is what is happening. We are being built together. And so, Lord willing, hopefully, as I submit and as you submit and as we grow together through the working of the Holy Spirit and in reading the scriptures and in being with one another, you know, Sid and I become closer than we were before. We become brothers more than we were before. Such that someday in heaven, when all things are made new in the new heaven and the new earth, we will in some sense be one while still being our individual selves. See, this is part of the beauty of Ephesians and all the beautiful jewels that God gives to us here about who we are. But this leads us into this prayer that Paul has for the Ephesians and to part of our task for one another as we live in this world. See, because Paul says these words not just because he wants the Ephesians to know that he is praying for them, but also as a model for how they ought to live in relationship to one another. For this reason, all these reasons that Paul is a fellow citizen uh, of the kingdom of heaven and that we together, him and them, are being built into the temple of the Lord. And, and earlier it says that Paul uh, knows that he received a call as an apostle to the Gentiles. That's another reason why he's praying for them. And because Paul gave... Uh, God gave Paul a task specific to those Gentiles. And because the, the church that, that God has called Paul to build among the Gentiles is also called to be the conduit of making known the manifold witness of God, which you can find in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. Right? Um, for all of these reasons and more... Paul prays these things. He kneels before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. And he prays that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Faith, Number one. And... and I have had such a blessing over the last little while, but all through my... And don't get a swelled head about this. <laughs> but you, Athens Christian Reformed Church, as a community, have been such a blessing to me. Because I have heard... I mean, there are lots of reasons why you're a blessing to me, but one of the reasons is that I have heard from you time and time again both when I am struggling and when I seem to be doing totally fine, that you are praying for me. And that is such a blessing for me. And I know that so many of you are praying for each other, too. And that is part of what Paul is talking about. He is praying for them, and he is modeling that they must pray for each other. And so we need to carry on and continue in this vein and pray powerfully for one another that we all may be strengthened with the power through the Holy Spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. This is one of the things that we must pray for one another. Pray that we would be imbued with the Holy Spirit uh, uh, so that we may be imbued with his power and so that Christ may dwell in our hearts. And that's what we prayed for when we prayed for David's sister, that she would experience God's presence. Right? 
And I pray that you further, Paul goes on, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And then you, you, go, you go on <clears throat> and it's awesome because Paul says immediately after this and to know this love that surpasses, surpasses knowledge he says on the one hand, right, I pray that you would grasp the, the whole measure of God's love. And then he goes in the next breath to say that's, that love is totally beyond us knowing. And that's part of the beauty of our faith, right? Is that we constantly and consistently are seeking to know and understand this God who is beyond understanding. And that we are learning more and more about the depth and height and width and breadth of God's love. And yet there is no way that we will ever plumb all of those depths and dimensions of God's love. That it is an eternal and infinite adventure to discover who God is and we will never come to the end of it. And this needs to be our prayer for each other. That you too would plumb the infinite depths of God's love. That you too would be rooted in that love. That you too would come to understand this surpassing love. That you may be filled to all the fullness of God. Filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Brothers and sisters, this morning, the message that we need to hear is that when you pray for one another, you are doing very much what God asks us to do through the Apostle Paul. You are living a life that is rooted and established in love. You are living as citizens of heaven. You are being part of the process that builds us together into a temple of the Lord. You are doing all of this and it is bringing you on that journey of discovering the depths of God's love. And also, you yourself are learning more of that love in your experience. And you yourself are being filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And that, brothers and sisters, should spur us on all the more Pray for one another. It's such a joy to do. And it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to wax on for 17 or 27 or 107 minutes at a time. You don't have to stop everything you're doing. You don't have to, you know, never produce any good thing in this world because you're always praying and that's all you're doing, which would be amazing. But you don't have to do that. You can pray without ceasing, right? Remember? There's a little reminder. Remember about prayer. Prayer is essentially talking to God. It is taking your mind and saying, this is not private space. This is not private space, but rather I am in constant communion and communication with God. There's no hidden space in my heart, but instead we are constantly talking, acknowledging that and living that out. And it can be as simple as praying a prayer with every breath you take. Lord Jesus, have mercy on Dorothy. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, have mercy on Rosemary. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Right? It can be a verse that you pray through for that day. It can be, uh, it can be anything. Lord Jesus, I'm so sad right now. Lord Jesus, I'm angry. Lord Jesus, what do I do? Right? But let us, like Paul, 
be spurred on to pray for one another that we may know this love that surpasses knowledge. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time together again. Oh God, please guide us in this week to come. Help us, O oh God, to remember to pray for one another. Help us, O oh Lord, to remember to talk with you, O oh God, that we may continue to be built up together in a temple of your Holy Spirit, that we together as members of your household, that we together as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, as we together as your children, grow into understanding more and more of your love that we may be filled to the full measure of all you have for us in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.